All right. So what do you guys do to remember, right? I, have, I will be honest. I am not good uh, at journaling or writing things down or anything like that. But God tells us, uh, as, as Israel crossed the Jordan, right, to, to do something so that you remember all the things that he has done. And I would be willing to bet that had I done a better job of writing things down or uh, something like that, that my thanksgiving to God would grow, right? All right, so good job. So today, uh, a couple of announcements before we kind of jump in. If you're going to be with us today uh, in the Bible passage, you can go ahead and open up to the Gospel of Luke. That's where we're going to start, Luke chapter 1, if you want to flip in your Bibles today. Uh, In terms of uh, just things, right, youth, uh, there's no youth tonight, right? This is just kind of the continuing of Thanksgiving. So you guys will start getting back together again next week. Uh, Advent packets, if you notice on the two side tables here, there's some bags on each table. What do you guys do during Advent, right, to, to, to remember, right, to, to enter into that journey, that faith journey that helps you focus uh, on the gift of the Savior? So we want to help you guys do that this year. So these are for, uh, for families. This is young and old, right? There's no, no ages on this, but there, there's stuff for all ages in them. If you'll grab one of those on your way out, uh, there's devotionals in there that focus on the messengers and the prophets and the servants uh, and the characters that God used, right? There's some simple ways in there that you guys can do to be the hands uh, and feet of Jesus to your neighbors uh, over the course of Advent. So each packet's got the devotional readings start. There are some craft supplies and things like that. Everything you'll need in there for the kiddos uh, if, you've, if you've got kids. So grab one before you go. Uh, if you're with us online and you'd like one, right, to do over the course of, of Advent leading up to Christmas, uh, send us an email to churchoffice at gallophill.org uh, and we'll figure out how to get one to you. We can come by and drop one off or we can mail it to you or whatever. But those are in the bags on the side tables. You guys grab one uh, on your way out. All right, so Before we jump into the message, I I mentioned to you last week that we would be talking about our 2021 ministry plans, okay? So I want to introduce that today, and this is going to take a couple minutes, uh, so just kind of settle in. How many of you guys have ever heard uh, of what we call a catechism? Anybody? Does that that name ring a bell? Yes, we've we've heard of that. How many of you guys, when I say that word, automatically think Catholic, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the same number of hands went up. Okay, so let's, let's, let's take a moment and do a little bit of, of re-education here. Uh, a catechism, throughout history, right, Christians have used these. Okay, there are a series of questions and answers, right, that teach the faith. They're designed for, for memorization. They're designed for meditation. They're designed to teach the core uh, beliefs of the faith and teach them through a systematic process, Right, so it's not just a Catholic thing. The Catholic Church uses them, but when the when the Protestant churches, whether Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, or whatever, we've been using catechisms for about 500 years to teach the faith. Uh, you may have heard of maybe the Westminster Catechism, right? The longer or shorter version. That's a Protestant one, or the Heidelberg is is my favorite. But they're written after the split with the Catholic Church to differentiate what Protestant believes from, from what Catherine believes. And so we've been using those. There's really none that have been put out in the last hundred years. Uh, it's a method of teaching that's kind of fallen out of practice in our day. And I think that's to our detriment. Uh, most of our, our discipleship programs kind of concentrate on Bible study uh, and we concentrate on prayer uh, and on evangelism and things like that. And these are good things, right? They teach us how how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to talk to others. They're less effective at teaching us what. What do we actually believe that sets us apart as Christians, right? And so this is where catechisms come into play. So I'm going to introduce to you today, it's called the New City Catechism. Uh, it's, a, it's a resource put out by the Gospel Coalition and Crossway, same one that does our ESV version of the Bible, based primarily on the Heidelberg, but it's a series of 52 questions and answers, one for each week of the year, that works its way systematically through who is God? How did he create? What did he create? What's God's law? How do we use God's law? How do we understand the Ten Commandments, right? What does it mean by by sin and the fall, and and how is our nature uh, changed as a result of that? Why do we need Jesus? Who was Jesus? Why did he have to do what he did? Why did he have to come and live and die? Why is it important that Jesus was human and God, right? What is, how do good works play into our lives, 
right? What about the Holy Spirit? What about prayer? What does baptism mean? What does communion mean, right? So each week in 2021, we're going to take one of these questions as the basis for what we as a church are learning, right? So each week, I'm going to take one, and that's what our sermon, there's a, there's a question, there's an answer, and then there's scripture passages in there that it's based off. We're going to take one of these each week, and on Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about it. As your kids go up to children's church, they're going to learn a simplified version up there, right? So they're going to come back. So when they walk down here, if you've got families and you go, hey, what'd you learn in children's church today? And they go, yeah, I don't remember. You ever had that happen? It's like, it was like 90 seconds ago. You just came down, right? You can go, oh, did you talk about? And they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, we did talk about that, right? So the youth are going to kind of build it into uh, some of the stuff that they're doing, right? We can talk about it in the community, however we want to do it. But the idea is that we are all learning and discussing the core beliefs of Christianity, right? We're going to give you things to think about during the weeks, give you some ways that you can do devotionals to meditate it on during the week. And we're going to encourage you guys to go through and memorize these, right? It's designed to be memorized. And that way it sinks in right down deep into your mind and into your heart. Okay? So you say, why this? Why now? Right? So we live in a culture. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, that our culture is bound and determined to essentially deconstruct everything. Right? Just take it and, and, and tear it down. Right? And to question everything and destabilize everything. And I believe that in order for faith to survive... Right? In order for church to survive, in order for you, really your faith to survive, we've got to adapt how we do things. Right? And we've got to take these truths that we believe and we've got to figure out how to drive them deeper into our minds and into our hearts than the things we see and hear around us every day. And this is a way to do that. So if you want to, this week, you can go ahead, if you go out on Amazon or christianbook.com, you can order one of these. They're about seven bucks each. We'll have some available uh, over the coming weeks that that we'll keep in here. Uh, Get one per person, not one per family, one per person. Okay, if you're in, we've got some smaller versions that we're going to give to your little kids. But so when we show up to worship in 2021, we're going to bring three things with us. We're going to bring a copy of God's word, whether you're sitting in here or you're sitting at your coffee table. You're going to bring a copy of this and you're going to bring a pen. And this is how we're going to do it moving into 2021. You guys with me? Makes sense? Okay, we'll be rolling out. There's, there's all kinds of other stuff that goes along with this, uh, but so that we can build a stronger foundation, right, so faith can survive. All right, so that's all I'm going to talk about. That was a little bit longer uh, announcement, but just be aware that that's coming out. There'll be emails, videos, all kinds of stuff. All right, grab your Bibles, open up to Luke, Luke chapter 1. It's Advent. Uh, on the Christian calendar, And maybe I should ask this question first, right? Are you guys aware that there is, in fact, a Christian calendar? Did you know there's one? Doesn't have, like, different months, right? Same months, January, February, March, April, May. Doesn't have different dates, but it does have different seasons, right? And today is the beginning of the first season of the Christmas, or excuse me, of uh, of the Christian calendar, right? And you move through the different seasons, and they each focus on different aspects of the faith. They they anticipate and and they celebrate some aspect of Christianity, whether it's the birth of Jesus or the resurrection or the ascension. So today, Advent begins four Sundays, right? This Sunday, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, which then the first Sunday, which is for us, I believe, is the 27th. That's Christmas Sunday for us. And then after that, it moves right into a a season from Christmas to Epiphany, from Epiphany to Lent. That may be one you're a little more familiar with. And then from Lent into Easter and on and on. But Advent is the first season, and it's a season of anticipation, of waiting, right, for the arrival of the Christ child, right, for the incarnation of God, for God stepping out of heaven and becoming a person. But here's the thing, I think that it, at least in my own life, and, and I've been a Christian, you know, since, I don't know, about 35 years, I guess. But I don't know that it's really ever hit me that Christmas, that, that Advent is a season of preparation to remember Jesus' first Advent, but also to look forward to his second Advent. Christ comes twice. 
Okay, so we look back and we remember and prepare and celebrate Jesus coming, that first advent, that Christmas, while at the same time looking forward and anticipating and preparing for that second advent. And I think it's, I, I don't necessarily, I, when, when I originally started going through Revelation, I didn't plan for it to work out that way, but it's worked out well that we've ended up in Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22 because there Christ comes the second time. So the way we're going to do this for our Advent series is we're going to kind of take this and we're going to look at both of these. We're going to each Sunday go back and take a passage from one of the gospels, Luke or Matthew or Mark, right? And then we're going to look forward and take one of our passages out of Revelation. And we're going to look at the two Advents of Jesus and ask ourselves, you know, who is the person that came right? What is the kind of the message that they're bringing, right? And how does that change you? How does that first advent and that second advent change us? Okay, so I'm going to pray for us, and we're just going to kind of jump into this thing, all right? Lord God, as as we jump into this, Lord, uh, into this time of remembering and looking forward, Lord, may you use this advent season in our lives, let this not just be another uh, of rat race of, of presents and cards and, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Lord, let, let it help us to pause and remember. And God, help us to look forward and see not only the Jesus of the manger, but the Jesus that comes again. And let that change us, Lord. Please let that change us. I pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So the first advent, right? We look back some 2,000 years ago on the first advent. And and I guess if you're following along in in your app or, or you're writing this down, your first point, right? When Jesus came the first time, he came as a humble servant king. All right. I'm going to read a passage out of Luke and Uh, It's one of my favorites, but it's Luke uh, chapter 1. I'm going to pick up in verse 26, and I'm going to go down through verse 38. You'll probably be familiar with this, but it says, Luke records, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed, engaged, kind of it's like betrothal is a, is, is a heavy engagement, right? It's, per, it's closer to marriage than it is engagement, but to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her, the angel Gabriel came and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And He will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be? since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Roughly nine months or so before that first Christmas, right, the heavens opened very quietly. There was no fanfare. Nobody saw it. And a single angel, Gabriel, was dispatched with a message from Yahweh. And he comes to visit this teenage girl, maybe 15, 16 years old, It's a private meeting. Mary's parents aren't there. Her betrothed, Joseph, is not there. Her friends are not there. The the description doesn't give us any sense of, of the timing of it. I've always kind of envisioned it as a night visitation. I don't know why. There's no indication, but I always see Mary in her room in her house, right, with a visit from the angel. One angel, one girl, one message, just for her ears. 
Right? The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid. You found favor with God, Mary. You're going to conceive and you're going to bear a son and you're going to call his name Jesus, right? And, and he is going to be the son of the most high and the Lord is going to give him the throne of David, the great king of Israel. And Mary is a descendant of David, right? So is Joseph. But don't worry, it's been like 900 years. So there's plenty of branches on the family tree. It's not weird like that, right? The angel has said he's going to reign over God's people forever. There's going to be no end to his kingdom. And the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you'll become pregnant, even as a virgin. Somewhere in the coming months, the word of God, right? The son of God, the second person of the Trinity, God himself, right? The father, the son, the Holy Spirit, the eternal, infinite, unchanging son, God himself voluntarily sets aside his glory, right? Sets aside the the honor and the majesty and the relationship of being part of the triune God in heaven and consents to come down and become a fetus in the womb of Mary, Holy Spirit reaches out and touches Mary and puts Jesus there. And he's born some nine months later in the normal way, right? Keep in mind, there's no anesthesia. We tend to kind of idealize that original Christmas setting, right? Silent night, holy night, punctuated by screams of pain uh, and anger, right? Get this thing out of me. All is calm. All is bright. Breathe, Mary. Breathe. Joseph, if you tell me to breathe one more time, I will kill you, right? Into a stable, probably a cave, is born the king of the universe and the king of Israel. They wrap him up just in strips of cloth and they place him in a feeding trough for animals and there is no royal welcome. There is no fanfare because this is not who the Jesus of Christmas is. He's a humble servant king sent by his father to the very people who've rejected him. And his birth anticipates his life, right? Because he comes to humbly serve everyone, right? This Jesus is going to grow up from a boy with with skinned knees and, and lots of energy to a young man with a very penetrating and unusual understanding of the persons and teaching of God. He's going to live his life quietly. The son of a carpenter in Nazareth, which is a backwater of Israel, which is in itself is a backwater of the Roman empire. Around his 30th birthday, he will begin his ministry. He will teach that you are to love your enemies and you are to pray for those who persecute you. He'll tell his disciples, no, 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 guys, you don't do it that way. That's not what it means to be great in the kingdom. We don't try to gain power over each other. You serve just as I came to be a servant. He will model humility as he washes his own disciples' feet just hours before he goes to the cross. He will answer prayers and requests of Jews and Gentiles. Men and women, old and young, he will dine with the rich and with the poor, with the righteous, righteous, and with sinners. He'll bless children and he'll raise them from the dead. He'll feed thousands. He'll touch and cleanse lepers and outcasts. And there is no one that he won't talk with or serve. And there's no place that he won't go. So maybe the question for us this Christmas as we celebrate this Advent season is how are you and I going to humbly serve others this Christmas? Right? What can your family do this Christmas to bless others? Okay? And don't say, ah, I got the, the, the virus. No, that's, that's an excuse. You may need to get a little more creative. But that's our calling, guys to love and serve those around us. How are you going to serve those around you like Christ did? Right? How can you bless, how will you love your enemies and serve them? The first advent right, brings us this humble servant king with a message of love to serve those around us. And that's our calling. 
Christmas is about reflecting, right, on, on renewing within us the will and the desire to love and to serve like Jesus did. And the challenge to you this Advent, and maybe our packets will help you do that, but the challenge is how do you love and serve those around you, especially those that don't believe in Jesus? That's the first Advent, right? This is, we look back on that birth of Jesus, right? It reminds us that he has called us not to be a country club. He has not called us to be, you know, this, this organization. He has, he has called us to be his hands and his feet. We have a month over the month of Christmas, a month where more people are, are in tune with, with even just this echo of Christianity in our culture that might be ready for you to step into their life and bring the love of Jesus. How are you going to do that? That's the first Advent. The second Advent is a little different. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. We sang about it today in the song that Dick chose for us. Revelation 19. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. I'm going to go down to verse 21. John is speaking. John the Apostle is speaking. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by a sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. A little different the second time. Jesus came the first time as a humble servant king. Jesus comes the second time as a glorious conquering king. The second coming, right? The, the heaven opens again, but this time it's not just one angel to one girl in one place, right? This time the heavens are torn open and a white horse appears. And seated on that horse is Jesus the Christ, right? Not lowly Jesus, meek and mild, not Jesus of the manger or even Jesus of, of the cross, but Jesus, the almighty king of the universe. And he comes not to a stable in a backwater, but he comes out of the heavens where nobody misses it. His eyes are a flame of fire. They see everything, right? Nothing is hidden from them. No thought, no motive, no action. He knows who you are. He knows what you believe. He knows what you love. And he knows who you serve. His robe is dipped in blood. It's not his own blood, the blood of the cross, the blood of forgiveness. It's the blood of his enemies. This is not a time of self-sacrifice, a time of giving yourself for others. This is a time of righteous judgment. 
This is the eternal word of God, right? This is the second person of the Trinity. This is the self-existent I am, the creator and sustainer of the world, the faithful and true one who keeps the promises of God. This is the King of kings, and this is the Lord of lords. And he comes with the armies of heaven, you and me, behind him. All that have gone before us, white and pure, dressed in the righteous garments of heaven, right? The second advent of Jesus, right? We are remembering his first advent and we are serving those around us and we are anticipating his second advent, which is going to be very different. And the message of the second advent is going to be very different. Jesus came to humbly serve everybody the first time. He comes to righteously rule all of creation the second time. Right, ever since the fall, Genesis 3, right, the world's been in rebellion against its creator and its king. We cast off the humble rule of God. We put ourselves on the throne. Satan tried to cast off the rule of God and take his throne. And in Christ's second advent, he is going to decisively reestablish God's rule, casting down false rulers, beasts, and false prophets that impersonate Christ. He will subdue all those in rebellion, kings, captains, mighty men, free, slaves, small, great. As Christ and his army emerge from heaven, right, they encounter the beast. At this point, I believe he will be a person, right, in in person, in, 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 in flesh, right, the power of the dragon and the false prophet likewise personified and the armies of the world, right, gathered together for the great battle of Armageddon, And it's not even a fight. There is no battle of Armageddon. It's just over. Verses 19 and 20, look at them. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and his army, ready for the battle, and the beast was captured. Game over. And with it, the false prophet. Satan and his forces have already been decisively defeated. When? When Christ came the first time and lived that perfect life and died on the cross. The real battle against evil guys was fought in the garden of Gethsemane by the eternal word of God enfleshed in human flesh. When he had to decide, am I going to do this? The real battle was in heaven at the moment of his resurrection when Michael and his host threw the dragon out on his ear. The real battle's been over for 2,000 years. Yes, there's still activity of Satan and the beast and the false prophet, and God has allowed that in his sovereignty to continue. But here at the end, there's no battle of Armageddon. It's just over. The beast is captured and the false prophet, the true king, has come. They are thrown into the lake of fire, hell. Did you notice that it says alive forever? And those that are allied with them are slain by Christ. So let me ask you, right, as we celebrate Advent, what's your vision of Jesus? Right, how do you see him? Because this passage offers us a very, very different view of Jesus than that which is, is, is talked about in the Gospels. Right? From his life presented in the Gospels, he's, he's a humble servant Jesus that lives perfectly and dies sacrificially for his enemies. But here, at his second advent, he is the divine warrior, the conquering king, who subdues God's enemies and casts them out and asserts God's sovereign rule over all and who crushes God's enemies in the winepress of the wrath of God. It doesn't get more vivid than that. How do you think about Jesus? Do you often think about the full biblical picture? One born in the stable, lowly, unnoticed except for shepherds and wise men. One who hung defenseless on a cross, taking the punishment for sin, calling us to serve him and serve others in weakness. Yet the one who will ride forth from the gates of heaven to execute vengeance with the saints at his back. This is Jesus. Don't mistake, guys, meek Jesus for weak Jesus. 
He's given everything, everything to reach those outside of his grasp and outside of his rule and outside of his kingdom with the love of God. He gave it all up to come down. He gave it all up on the cross. And he calls you and me to do the same in humility and in respect and in grace. Yet for those who reject him, for those who choose to live life without him and ignore him and persecute his people, he will take everything. And he will crush the opposition and the birds will feed on their corpses. There's another great feast. We talked about one great feast last week. You guys remember it? The marriage supper of the lamb. There's a second great feast. At the first great feast, you are the guest of honor. At the second great feast, you're on the table. When you worship Jesus, who do you see? Do you see the full biblical picture? The baby in the manger, washing feet, preaching, hanging on a cross, and at the same time, existing eternally, waiting in heaven right now to bring God's kingdom finally and fully back to his creation. We remember the first advent. We look forward to the second advent. So this Christmas, right, this advent, remember Jesus, meek and lowly, and go out and serve those around you. Serve them sacrificially. Serve them with love. Pour yourself out for them. Those in your family, those in your neighborhood, those at your work, on your boat, in your school, Pour yourself out for them. But don't forget the full picture of the God we serve. The God that reaches out a hand in forgiveness now. But that hand doesn't stay reaching out forever. One day it's withdrawn. And the heavens are torn open. And the end comes. I'm going to pray for us.